Back out here on Project 17, if you follow along with the Management Advantage you hopefully saw last year where we started this project. Back in the early spring, we came in here in stubble cornfield and we installed 2,500 plus hardwood tree species. Outside of that, we installed seven acres of switchgrass and, and select blocks around here. In between and around everything, we have a clover chicory fire break and um, basically a, a cover crop to, to protect my trees between the tree rows. Lanes, food plots, fire breaks, serving the purpose well. And, and then we also have three strategically located food plots in the different various corners of these fields based on where I, the known deer movement. I get to see this every weekend. So it's a huge contrast for us to come out here and film this for you guys to see what a year's difference and a year's maturity has made. I mean, these are real on the ground comparisons that we can show you today of, the, of how this thing has progressed in one year's time. Here we are in the middle of June, and this thing was started a year ago, March, when we first planted those hardwood trees. So these are real, real wildlife management results that we're going to show you today. It's hard to believe that these clumps of warm season grasses were maybe, maybe four to six inches in diameter last year. They did get five feet tall at the tops by the end of the summer. And just walking out here among these, you can just see the diameter increase, the volume of the total mass of the plant is doubled or tripled. And here we are in the middle of June and this stuff is already neck high to me in spots. And uh, I can just imagine that by the end of the summer this year, second year planting, that these grasses will be at that six to seven, eight feet tall range. Um, and by the third year, they will really be maxing out of their, their full potential diameter and height. And I can attribute that to the way that we prepared this field and the way that we planted this last year. Um, we did a really effective chemical burn down with a pre-emergent control in here to eliminate and reduce weed competition. And I did a follow up after the seeds were germinated uh, with a 2,4-D one that was safe enough to do so on these grasses to kill broadleaf weeds. And we smoked a lot of the mare's tail and some of this other stu uh, stubborn broadleaf weeds. But you look at the value that this is providing the wildlife. This was one of the most exciting components of this plan for me was the warm season grass areas. I just absolutely love it. And I think a lot of you guys too, but if you're not familiar with it and why it's so valuable, think about the comparison of grass that's in your yard, a soddy type grass and let, letting that get really tall. Um, a, a culprit that we're all familiar with is the Kentucky 31 tall fescue, that old pasture grass. It creates a sod carpet and chokes out all the good vegetation and good forbs and weeds that are valuable and, and important to a whitetail's diet. But it creates a no-go zone that no animal wants, to, especially small birds and small um, you know, fawns and turkey poults and, and quail nesting and pheasants if you have them. Compare that and contrast that to a bunch grass, which is a clump of grass that has spatial distancing between each individual plant, which allows you to have tunnels and runways in here. So when you stand off at a distance and look at a, a sea of warm season grasses, it looks like it just a, it's chock full of nothing but massive vegetation. But if you get down here at ground level, there are tunnels and routes between all these individual clumps of grass that give animals a perfect uh, habitat in a, in a situational area where they can escape predators, get in the shade, and move about and feed and feel totally comfortable. And also as these grasses get taller too, protection from avian predators above. You know, hawks, there's a couple hawks circling this field right now as we speak. But it's an exciting component of habitat. It's one that's missing in a lot of areas. Um, Reintroduction to prairie grasses is a, is a phenomenal way. If you're a conservation-minded person, it's, it's resorting some land back to its original state. And one of those, as I said, that's not as, not as common as it should be. It's just not one of those things because it t does take time for it to mature and get to this point and beyond that a lot of people don't want to put the time and effort into it. But it's well worth it. We planted 2,500 sapling hardwood trees in this property last year. And 
Primarily, these are all oak species. Here's one right here. This is a swamp white oak, and he's kind of poking out through the clover here that's helping shelter it. But some people may wonder, how do I select species to plant? Why, you know, why choose certain things? It all, develop, it all depends on your objectives. And my objective for this field was to provide um, mast producing trees that will drop an acorn that the deer and the wildlife will want to eat. Secondarily, the specific oak varieties that I chose have a tendency to hold their leaves later through the fall into the early winter. So as these trees mature and they still are holding full canopy of leaves, it's going to provide additional cover and sight and screening in here. This basically create a early successional thicket like we talked about before. But, and then third, and I won't, I won't realize this in my lifetime, but maybe my grandchildren will someday, that these are desirable hardwood tree species that ha will have a marketable, marketable value to them um, at some point in time in the future. Maybe great-grandchildren. But anyway, so there are lots of options, whether you want soft mast, um, fruit-producing trees, acorn trees like these oaks are, different things that there's options for you available, but consult with a, a wildlife biologist or a, a consultant that specializes in, in trees and uh, it'll help you make these selections. I bought these through the state nursery and they were very inexpensive. I think I paid 37 cents a piece for these as 12 foot, excuse me, as 12 inch tall, you know, one year old whips. Looking down the line, more of them, uh, they're really showing. This is the second year, as I said, so they're coming out of dormancy and putting on some growth. Here's another good example. I'm hoping if the deer will leave these alone long enough that they may get three or four feet tall this first year, excuse me, this first full growing season after, after they were installed last year. So basically a, the second season here. You'll notice right here next to me, there's lots and lots of white blooming clover. And this was something that I chose on purpose to do because it created a nice cover crop to help shelter the trees like you're seeing it do right now, but also because this is really highly desirable forage for my deer. And if you look, this is chicory, and you can see where the, the deer are just consuming the tops right off the chicory. They're out here selectively feeding and picking what they want, choosing this and choosing that based on palatability and nutrition value. Um, so the idea was if I can overwhelm them with food, that maybe they won't be as hard on my trees. So. Um, it's kind of an experiment because I know I'm also attracting deer to this area too, but the idea was to just give them so much food that they would hopefully pr put on less browsing pressure on my new trees as they're starting to try to grow. Last year when we placed this big country redneck blind here on this corner, I knew eventually that the switchgrass, big blue stem, and the Indian grass were going to get tall enough to help conceal some of the foundation, the, the stand and the ladder platform for this, for this blind. But to ensure that we had an ability to climb in and out of this uh, and be as hidden as possible, I planted giant miscanthus grass all the way around it. And I'm sure you guys have heard of that by now. It's uh, it's a perennial warm season grass. It was cultivated as a landscape plant. These are hi hybrids, they're sterile, so they will not propagate and spread throughout your, your plant community. So there's no concerns uh, if you're conscious about those kinds of things. It's that plant will be one plant, it will never go anywhere else. But these things will get 16 feet tall. And we were just discussing earlier, there probably will be a point in time next year that I'll have to trim them uh, at window level so that they won't block the view of the blind. <clears throat> but the idea here is to create a wall of green and encompass this ladder and, and tower, which it will do. This is second year planting. I bought these though as, uh, you can buy them as rhizomes, which are just basically little tuber roots. Um, you can buy them very inexpensively that way and till up the soil and plant them and with some chemical preparation, you can make sure that you don't have a weed competition against them and they'll grow. It's gonna take them three or four years to really show their true size that way. So I wanted to 
sort of fast forward things here. And I bought these as two, two gallon potted plants, just like you would buy, you know, at the lawn, uh, home and garden areas at like a, a nursery. But I bought these through a, a mail order place up in Michigan. Anyway, last year we planted them. They were probably that big around. And this year they're five times that. And um, they are going to, probably by the end of this summer, I'm assuming they'll get nearly to the bottom of the platform. <clears throat> and by next year, they will be at the tower or at the blind level up, up top. But it's really amazing if you get down to look at them as a bunch. They, they started out, this little guy started out about this big around last year. And this is one year's growth and maturity as it's spread. It's just increasing in diameter. The, the stalks are getting thicker, more leaves per stalk, and it's just shooting, it, shooting up to the, uh, to the sun. Really cool plant, easy to maintain. It'll die down in the fall and winter time after it's frost and, or frozen and killed. But just like your lawn grass, it will come back, it will come back next year. And the, the stems, the structure is really sturdy, so it stands well through the late winter, even with snow on it and ice. So it's a good choice for screening. A lot of guys are making hallways and walls, blocking off fields and access routes to and from stands. Um, visibility from the road to hide your food plots and things like that. It's a great choice for that. And uh, inexpensive and super easy to maintain.